couple of minutes late. Sorry about that. Got to grab inoculation loops. So let me give this just a minute for people to show up. Let's see. Okay. It looks like it's up. Okay. Hello. Um, all right. So hopefully uh, everybody saw part one of this um, last weekend. And for those of you that had plants um, that came with our kit, you should be seeing expression by now. Uh, so I'd be interested to see anybody's uh, or hear anybody's, um, you know, outcomes. Uh, it would be really nice if, uh, like, if you have some pictures uh, or something like that, post them on Facebook. Because uh, I'm streaming this to YouTube and to Facebook. So, um, yeah, this one we're going to we're going to do a little review of uh, the protocol itself for people who didn't see the first one, uh, and then uh, we'll get into some of the more um, uh, mechanical parts of it, uh, like how it works, or maybe more how you work it. Uh, then we'll answer a bunch of questions as we go. And, um, you know, if anybody had any trouble last weekend, uh, anything unexpected or didn't work or anything like that, uh, you know, I can try and help you and answer questions as we go. So, um, to start with, um, this is uh, agroinfiltration, um, uh, the review part here. Uh, agroinfiltration is a method of uh, quickly genetically modifying plants. So the plants that we were, um, <laughs> I like this one, uh, when insect genetic engineering kit, that would probably get the uh, EPA on us real quick, start making genetically modified flies and mosquitoes and stuff like that, that might, um, that might present a real containment problem. Um, but as far as plants, um, you know, these are uh, temporary genetic modifications. So even if it does like escape into the wild, none of these are going to, um, on their own, as is with the kit, propagate and spread and, you know, change anything about the environment, really. Uh, so the kit that we have, uh, allows you to basically change the color of leaves. Uh, and I'll show you an example. So this is one that was done a while back. It's a little tobacco plant. Oh, so you can see these spots were modified and this leaf was modified in several places. Oh man, I can't work with this camera. So nice. All right. Now, uh, agroinfiltration, uh, as was discussed last time, uh, uses bacteria, these guys, right? So they're growing on a petri plate. Um, and they have a special mechanism that they use uh, to modify plants. The general protocol is pretty straightforward. Uh, you have a special buffer, right? Which is this stuff, which comes in the kit. Uh, it comes as a small tube, and you mix it with water, and it makes a large tube. So it's a concentrate. Um, you add that to a different tube, scrape some of these bacteria off using an inoculation loop. And if anybody wants, I can demonstrate that in more detail. Um, add it to a small tube like this that you've added uh, the buffer and bacteria to. Shake it up, break up the clumps, and then you're going to use a small syringe like this one to literally inject it into... Um, uh, literally injected into uh, the plant. Um, and that can give you uh, a temporary genetic modification. Um, and I say temporary, not 
the area that's modified is permanently modified. Um, whether expression is permanent is a different question. It has to do with a lot of things. But the, the genetic modification should be permanent because it's modifying the genome. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the whole plant is modified or that, um, you know, its seeds will be modified or anything like that. So um, the nice thing about that is it gives us a really safe kind of fun place to play where we can test out things really quickly because it only takes a few days, three, four, five days. Everybody who uh, did this along with the class last time should have some patches and they should look, you know, something like the ones we showed, maybe something a little more, uh, a little less organized, like this one. This is one I did a while back. Whoa. And so these were done around that same time. You can see. And also, if you're, oh, oh, if you're doing prototyping, uh, one thing, um, one thing that can be helpful if you're doing experiments. Uh, is you can actually write with a Sharpie. Uh, I recommend using a, um, not the fine tip Sharpie, but like the regular Sharpie and then just writing really lightly uh, because you can then erase it uh, by just taking a Q-tip with a little alcohol and just gently sort of like going in little circles over the Sharpie and it'll erase your Sharpie and then you're just left with, you know, your modified leaves. Now, Uh, as far as this person, should I go to university or learn just by doing work in garage? Um, Carol, that's a complicated question for me to answer because I only ever tried the one way. Uh, I just, I didn't have the opportunity really to go to a university, so I just did what I could do. Um, so I can't really speak to how useful the other way would really be. Um, that worked for me, but I can't say it's been a really common path. Um, is there a way we can modify the plant uh, for the seeds to make the same plant forever? I'm going to do a wall of this and we'll die. So that's something we'll get into um, a little bit more, but uh, there is there are ways to make it permanent, right? Uh, but that usually involves a couple of different paths. One, you can do um, sort of floral dips. So you can dip the flower, which doesn't work in a lot of plants, but you can dip the flower in, like you can just take like, the media and the agrobacterium and just dunk the flower in there. And your goal is to modify the, the, the cells that will become seeds. Then you plant those seeds and those seeds grow up into whole genetically modified plants. It doesn't work very well with a lot of species though. So most of the time what you end up doing is uh, uh, tissue culture. So for plant tissue culture, you can imagine you take some of these red cells, right? These modified cells and you'll punch them out, uh, put them on a dish, and then uh, you sort of give them hormones that revert them back into stem cells. And then you give them more hormones that make them develop leaves and stems, and then more hormones that make them develop roots. And then you clone that whole thing, you grow a brand new plant that's all those cells. And there's ways to make that more efficient, right? Uh, you can do things like uh, antibiotic selection, drug selection. Uh, as Professor Mark. I wouldn't suggest going to you if you just want to learn biohacking, much better stuff. But <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's good to get some uh, input from uh, somebody who's got a, a sense of the other side. Uh, what's a good microscope for bioengineering? So that's a question uh, I get a lot. It depends on what you're doing. If you're working with bacteria, you almost never need a microscope. So if you're engineering bacteria or something like that, uh, something like like these plants, like I don't use a microscope at all for these plants. I don't use a microscope for bacteria. Um, occasionally, I'll use a microscope for some things. When I'm working with uh, like human cells growing in culture, I'll use uh, an inverted microscope. Uh, but you can get a super cheap inverted microscope and it's fine. Um, if I'm using uh, some special stuff, I'll use like a, a fluorescent microscope or fluorescent inverted. Um, uh, or like when I'm working with like sperm or something like that for sperm mediated gene transfer experiments. Um, I'll use a microscope mostly just to like check their general health and stuff, but like literally any microscope will do that. Um, inverted microscope is not a brand, it's a type of microscope. So normally microscopes have the like optics at the top uh, and the light at the bottom, uh, but inverted is 
uh, light at the top, optics at the bottom. So instead of looking at the top of your sample, you're looking at the bottom of your sample. Uh, and that's good for things where, uh, like if you have like a flask of human cells or something, and they're all stuck to the bottom, growing along the bottom as like a sheet of sort of skin almost, uh, you can look at them easy through the bottom. Uh, tell me your secret for inverted microscope, blue painter's tape. Honestly, so that is one thing. Um, this is more the human cell class stuff, but like here's my uh, heavily abused uh, inverted microscope. But it's, uh, yeah, if you cover part of the, uh, oh, this one's broken. If you cover part of the, uh, the light source, uh, you can create sort of a drop shadow embossed effect, and it makes a lot of the sort of three-dimensional shape of the, um, the things on the plate really uh, much easier to see than just full light. So normally more expensive microscopes will have irises and stuff where you can change the shape of the light or you can add like filters and stuff that can like do that sort of thing for you. <clears throat> but you can also just stick some tape on the light, like block half of it, and it gives you way more detail. Um, but okay, back to the plants. So did anybody uh, who's watching currently have, um, have plants that they did along with the live class last week? Um, if so, I'd be really interested to hear your, you know, results. Um, or if anybody had any problems or if they failed or anything like that. Um, but okay, so let's get a little bit into uh, how it works. I'm not going to go too deep into how agrobacterium works, like, naturally, but more like um, uh, how you can work it, uh, like from a genetic engineer perspective. Uh, how would you be able to implement gene drive and tissue culturing? Um, I don't know if a gene drive has ever been done in plants. Uh, plants, you generally don't have to do things like gene drives because often you can self-fertilize. So like if you want to make sure that all the offspring have your genetic modification, you can just um, uh, breed it to itself and, and it'll all be the same. So you don't necessarily have to use a gene drive to increase the frequency of spreading. Um, but if you wanted to do that, uh, you probably could. Uh, you have to integrate CRISPR and stuff like that, but it's not so much uh, about tissue culturing. Tissue culturing is just sort of a step in plant cloning. Uh, that would be more in like what you're delivering. You would have to engineer a gene drive into your payload, uh, the genes that you deliver to the plant, so that uh, as that plant reproduced, well, after you cloned it, um, it would uh, have a gene drive, so the genes would propagate more quickly to its, or more frequently to its offspring, rather than being like half its offspring get the modification, half of them don't, they just all would. So, um, yeah, yeah. So this is really common, punching through the leaf. Like, it's just tricky, right? Because you're... This guy... So this is something that um, just happens a whole lot, right? Um, these leaves are, like tobacco leaves are pretty soft, right? Which is I'm pretty sure the reason people um, really like them and part of the reason it works so well uh, is, and, and the reason people have spent a lot of work uh, trying to make it a model organism is, I mean, you look at this plant, if you want some leaf, like this thing's all leaf, you know? So it's just like leaf. Um, and you've got a lot of nice, soft, pliable, big leaves uh, to work with. Um, uh, how is agrobacterium found in the soil? Uh, as far as how would you locate your own agrobacterium, uh, they're pretty ubiquitous in a lot of areas. Uh, I imagine you could just take a soil sample, culture bacteria on something pretty standard like LD, uh, and then just do a whole bun bunch of of uh, colony selection and PCR for 16S, and then send it out for sequencing, and then eventually, hopefully, find something in the agrobacterium family. The faster way would not be to go for soil. It would be to look for a crown gall. Uh, so if you found a crown gall, uh, which is like a tumor on a plant that agrobacterium make, uh, or at least wild agrobacterium make, 
you can uh, potentially culture them out of that. But the way fastest way to get agrobacterium is just to buy it off the internet. So you can buy it from us or we, like with the kit, or if you want some unloaded agrobacterium. Uh, I don't know if we offer that yet. We might, but um, I think you could buy it from Carolina or Amazon, something like that. Um, I found if you get a tile saw, you can use the bottom of the old glass bottles as petri dishes. Yeah, I mean, I started out with glass petri dishes. I used glass petri dishes for years and years. The nice thing about them is they're, um, uh, you know, they're reusable. Like you don't produce so much plastic waste. You just wash them, autoclave them, use them again. They're they're lovely. Uh, is there a way to focus CRISPR on only one type of cell? So you're using CRISPR a little bit wrong here. Um, is there a way to specifically genetically modify? So CRISPR doesn't really mean genetic modification. It's a specific technique. Um, but is there a way to focus your genetic modification on a specific type of cell? Sure. The easiest way is to only inject that kind of tissue. Like if I want to do like leaf cells i'll just only inject the leaf cells right um other ways there are tissue specific promoters so you can have it so that even if it does modify the wrong type of cell it doesn't express your gene in that kind of cell and if you're using things like viruses there are viruses that specifically infect certain tissue types or at least at a higher frequency so yes there are ways to focus your genetic modifications on specific tissue types types of cells so but to answer the other question Let's go with uh, sort of some technical tips on how to not punch holes in your stuff. So I like these little bitty syringes. They're, um, you know, they're small and it's not maybe what everybody's used to, but every like bit of plunger to press moves a really small amount of liquid. Uh, so it kind of gives you some sort of fine control because you're not moving so much liquid in one go but it really depends on like what you're comfortable with so i'm trying to get this on the laptop all right uh so one of the mo like most common mistakes is people just push too hard right so if you just push too hard you'll punch right through the leaf and you'll make a hole uh and then that that part of the leaf will just die because it's it's a hole um okay so one thing, you know, just try not to suck up any air, push the air out. Um, if you're not really familiar with working with syringes, it just takes practice. But yeah, so the key for me, uh, I don't know if this is a safe practice. <laughs> uh, agrobacterium, by the way, can modify human cells. It's been done. It's not very efficient. It's not nearly as good as plants. Um, but it's something to be aware of. Um, so uh, when you're pushing down on it, you wanna get between like these little vein structures. So you'll see there's like a ridge. And obviously if you're trying to push something flat and it's like half on a ridge, then it's just gonna leak out. You're gonna have to use tons of pressure to basically just crush it flat. So if you start with a flat space, you can use very light pressure. So you start with a really light, nice and flat spot and you just press and you'll see it starts leaking. Uh, so, yeah, David, don't inject yourself. Um, so then you just sort of increase the pressure a little bit while you apply steady pressure. Uh, and it's more about like a nice, long, even, steady pressure. And you want it to just continue to infiltrate into the thing. Without gloves, it's a little easier to feel the... Um, it's a little easier to feel the, the amount of pressure that you're doing because the glove just deadens your senses just a little bit. A larger syringe might help some people. For me, the smaller syringe is better because you're using, uh, yeah, and I mean, if you're cutting with your fingernails, definitely, because you're using a, I mean, the tips on most syringes are kind of like lure lock size. So as far as like the actual, um, like the actual surface area of the syringe end, is pretty straightforward and some brands of syringes have like more rounded or more uh like sharply cut edges uh yeah yeah and instead of autoclaving with glass where you can definitely just boil stuff too uh, or even just put it in the oven and cook it at you know high temperature for a long time you can sort of dry autoclave things 
Um, interesting. I mean, uh, let me know how the uh, how the bulbs come out. That's uh, that's really interesting. I've tried it in stems. I've tried it in a lot of the different parts of the plant. I've tried dipping whole little like seedlings, like the moment the seed opens. Um, I've tried a lot of different stuff. Um, but yeah, so one of the things you want to do is while you're infiltrating, right, you just be mindful of the pressure. And not all spots are the same. So some spots are just hard. They just don't want to infiltrate well. And some spots are just a lot easier for I have no idea what reason. You just push in there and it just goes whoosh. One of the things I'm seeing a lot of now um, is a lot of people are having expression in extremely localized areas. Uh, so one thing I want to be clear about is that you really want to let it spread if you're trying to get a uh, sort of a bigger spot. Now, if you're trying to write something, and I've done words, um, you know, you want it to be like a a finer pixel size. But the problem is, here. you can see on this one that these little circles, that's the actual like injection site. So the pressure is really high. Oh man, can I work this thing? Okay, there we go. So the pressure is really high and the, uh, oh, the camera's inverted. All right. So, uh, and the, the pressure of the syringe itself is also, um, you know, it's also harmful. So uh, often those circles end up dying. Now you can do it if you're really good. And I've done a lot of practice. So if you're really good, you can you can just push a little bit into it very gently and you'll get a, um, uh, you'll get a, a relatively small section, but you'll also get a reasonably low pressure and you won't get any damage to the leaf itself. Um, but that that just takes a lot of practice. So just practice and practice. Um, now what you really want to do is you want to let it spread. So once you like, instead of like inject, 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 inject all next to each other, you just inject one spot and just let it leak out through the leaf. Right. So like when it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you're avoiding like the crop circles, yeah. So if you just inject, you know, you can just kind of keep letting it go. And it'll just keep growing and growing into this space. Now, uh, obviously, you can get too high a pressure and it will um, punch through. And then usually it kind of stops or it'll hit like a vein and usually it won't cross the veins. Um, so if you just be gentle with it and just let it spread kind of where it wants to naturally spread, uh, it's usually pretty good. And you can get like. If you just take your time and just let it keep going, you can get a really large region. Like, I'm just going to let this one go for a minute and just be patient. Like, it doesn't take a lot of pressure. It just takes some doing, right? And you can get, like, a pretty big space. You can see how much of that is from one injection, right? So you just stick it in there and just let it spread. So if you wanted to do, like, half a leaf, you could do half a leaf or the whole leaf with you know, maybe 10 total injections. And maybe if your pressure's a little high, you'll get a couple of circles, but the majority of it will be modified. So if you're trying to make something decorative, um, you can do it with minimal damage. Kind of like this little guy. You know, you can see there are some circles. Oh, there are some circles in it. But, um, uh, you know, most of the modified area kind of follows the pattern of uh, the veins in it. So, all right, yeah, Biohack Planet, that's my shirt. This is from last year, or from, yeah, 2020, our Biohack Planet shirt. It's uh, burnt orange because we're in Austin. So, all right, let's see. Um, now, as far as what can you do sort of next? Like, what's the, what's the next step? Um, and that, I think, is the more interesting part. Like, this is sort of like, intro to the possibilities and you can do some things that are it was joe made that one most of mine are a little more spotty except for the words and stuff um and i did some smiley faces and things but um yeah you can you can and you can decorate the plant in pretty much whatever way you want now currently it only really works with the leaves and we haven't tested in a whole lot of species i've tested 
other things in the nightshade family. So tobacco is a nightshade plant. So that's also like potatoes, tomatoes, uh, uh, peppers, all sorts of things. Um, and so my hope was that if it works so well in tobacco, maybe it'll work really well in tomatoes and potatoes and all these things. So I tested in peppers and tomatoes and I didn't get any to work. Um, I tested in a few other plants. Um, and sometimes the plants actually need damage. So we tried one of these like decorative plants and some things have really thick leaves. That's another point I was going to make. Some things have really thick leaves. And what you have to do is you have to make a starter hole. Uh, you can just take a needle. Like if this got like a really thick leaf, you just take a needle and just punch a hole in it and then, you know, follow through with the blunt syringe and it'll just flood in there really good. Um, uh, but the, the skin on some of these tougher leaves is just, it just doesn't work very well. Um, but yeah, once you take, once you take the, uh, uh, once you take the, the genes that you have, which in this case, uh, is a, a little group of enzymes, right. That make, uh, make a, a, another compound that's common in plants like beets and it makes things red. So this is very like, uh, demonstration kind of thing. It's nice because you can make decorative plants or you could do cool things. You could write messages, you could be like, I love you, whatever you want. Um, and Hey, Valentine's is coming up. So that might be a cool gift. I don't think anybody has ever probably ever at this point in history received a custom genetically modified Valentine plant. So maybe somebody has, but I don't think anybody has. So probably more than I will be this, this, um, Valentine's Day. So if you want to be amongst the first, now's your chance. The, um, uh, but the, but the, the general point is, say you wanted to do something that you've just always wanted, right? You want to make spicy tomatoes. So you look at, okay, what's the biosynthesis pathway for capsaicin? Uh, how do you synthesize the DNA code that encoded the red pigment? So, <clears throat> In this case, we didn't. Uh, we just um, received it from University of California. Um, <laughs> the crazy story of Jane, the plant I killed. Oh, no. <laughs> um, maybe we can resurrect it. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you another one. Uh, the, um, but yeah, so uh, how do you synthesize the DNA? Uh, the easiest way to get DNA synthesized uh, is there are synthesis, DNA synthesis companies, right? So you can go to places like SynBioBeta, or excuse me, SynBioTech, or you can go to uh, like GenScript or a million. You can just look up like DNA synthesis and there's a, thousands of companies. You can literally just, um, uh, you can literally just go to the, their website, put in the sequence that you want, they'll slap it in a plasmid, manufacture it and mail it to your house. Um, I have to remember to water the thing though. Yeah. These are actually pretty tough. Like I have, um, uh, I have, I have like, um, you know, failed to water them, especially like over the weekend or like we, when we have like a, 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 a holiday or I have to take a day off or something and it'll be like, they look really sad and wilty. They're just like, <sighs> And you give them some water, and a couple hours later, they've recovered really nicely. So they're they're reasonably drought tolerant. They're not very cold tolerant. So people living in Canada or Colorado, be careful. The um, I wouldn't even get them anywhere near freezing. They would just collapse on you. Um, but uh, what was I saying? DNA synthesis. Yeah. So the easiest way is to just send it off, have it done. Um. You can edit DNA yourself by subcloning. Um, that's a whole complicated thing, though. It's really not that bad. You gotta use special enzymes and stuff like that. Uh, my YouTube channel has a few, well, I at least used to have a few videos on uh, subcloning. They may be on my Odyssey channel now because YouTube removed a lot of my educational videos. Um, but um, yeah, so. Uh, one of the things I want to get into is, is how we can make our own custom things, right? So let's say you want to make a, a spicy tomato, right? It's just born spicy. So you have to look up the biosynthesis pathway for capsaicin. <clears throat> and then you look at your target plant, which in this case is a tomato. Uh, the tomato 
is um, is going to have some of those enzymes already, right? So plants use enzymes to make various molecules that they need. Uh, capsaicin uh, is going to be made from something else. So you'll look at the biosynthesis pathway for capsaicin and you'll be like, okay, so it starts with this thing and then it makes this and this and this and this and these enzymes make each thing um, and then it makes capsaicin. Well, tomatoes make all of these things, but they don't have these last two enzymes, we'll say. Born spicy. <laughs> I wish, shoot. The, um, uh, so the last two uh, enzymes is what you need to add. So you need to add these two genes. Uh, and that's what you're going to do with your genetic modification. You're going to add these two genes. Um, the nice thing about agroinfiltration is it's really great for prototyping. So it's really great for, um, <clears throat> at least if it's something that you intend to express in the leaves, which you could always change your promoters, but whatever. If it's something you intend to express or capable of expressing in the leaves, then you can turn uh, you can turn the whole project around really quickly. So instead of spending literally months cloning your your thing to see if it worked um you can take the leaf squirt wait three days later let's test this and see if my modification worked if it actually does make uh capsaicin if it's really a, a, a spicy leaf <laughs> or whatever and then uh when that's uh successful so you may have to like iterate a few times so you 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 know find a problem fix it whatever then you uh uh, you're taking a cutting of what you have left. Uh, so I have, there's a trouble, but I'll get into that in one second. Uh, remind me if I don't. Um, so the, uh, you can just test it. You can test it in the leaf. And then uh, if it doesn't work, you can do some iterations on your design. And then, okay, this is really great. Works super good. Now we can do the complicated part of making it a whole plant and then a whole lineage of plants. But uh, with the cutting, so that is something I'm working on issue. So this will make a good demo. So, uh, all right, this is a leaf. This right here, right, is a node, right? So each place where the, where the, it branches off the stem into the sort of stem of the leaf, each little leaf thing here, that's a node, right? Now, if I were to cut the tip off of this plant, right? Like it just, it grows from the tip, right? And so this tip has got special cells in it uh, that know they're the growth tip and they will like continue to go out and produce nodes and produce stems. Now, uh, yes, it is possible to produce multiple colors on one plant. If you had the genes for multiple things, yeah, you could do like, you know, red and, and, and green and yellow if you had like, you know, uh, uh, carotenoids or something like that or purple uh, or something like that. So you could use a bunch of different stuff. Uh, can you use regular auger to grow out regular agrobacteria? Yes, you can. Uh, they'll grow just fine on LD. Um, so, uh, though I would recommend uh, using uh, um, uh, some antibiotics to select for them. Uh, the strain that we're using has a genomic mutation that makes them uh, antibiotic resistant, so you can select for them with that. Uh, but each node, inside the node, are cells. Oh. Okay, I hit a button. Hold on. Okay, it went full screen for a second. I was worried. All right, so I'm going to back up a little bit so I don't push buttons. Um, yeah, so each node has basically a little blob of stem cells inside the node. Uh, and that blob of stem cells are more capable than just the leaf cells, right? So, and this varies from species to species. Some species, yeah, you can just take a chunk of leaf stab it in the ground and it'll develop roots and become a whole thing. Uh, with uh, tobacco and most of your belladonna plants, the stems are capable of producing roots. Uh, the leaves are not capable of producing roots and the nodes are capable of producing leaves and stems. So what you really would want is to use agrobacterium to modify a node. If you could modify the stem, you could get roots and get a whole plant. If you could modify the node, you could get stem and get the whole plant. If you could get, but just modifying the leaves doesn't allow you to get roots. And that's a problem because without roots, there's no plant. So you have to go the long way around and do uh, tissue culture. Now, I have tried cutting into the node and trying to agro infiltrate the node itself. Uh, I've tried injecting the node with like a syringe 
I've tried infiltrating and injecting the, uh, the stem itself. Uh, I've tried a dozen different variations on how to do it. I've tried where I infiltrate the node and then cut the growth tip off. Because when you cut the growth tip off, it causes a hormonal change in the plant. And that causes each of these nodes to start producing new growth tips, right? So, yeah, so this other plant's a good example of that. So you can see this one's just from a seedling, right? So it's just like a plant. There's another little plant here. It's actually two seeds that wound up in the same thing. But otherwise, it's just one stem, growth tip, bunch of leaves. And that's the normal pattern of growth for tobacco. You see, this guy's a little different. It's got, um, it's got a branch here. But that's because this one was grown from a cutting. So I cut the stem. Oh, I don't know if I can still see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I cut the stem a few times. I can't see the scar anymore, but it will heal. But yeah, so you see how it's branching and all this stuff? That's not its sort of typical growth pattern. Uh, but it's branching because when you cut it, you get things like this emerging, oh, emerging from the nodes. Okay, this will be a better angle. Yeah, so you see how I have you know, these leaves emerging from the nodes parallel to these leaves. Uh, and like right here, This node has produced a whole new growth tip with a new stem and new leaves. And, you know, you can do it over and over again. So if you cut the growth tip, all of the stems will suddenly start producing leaves uh, or start producing, producing growth tips. So ideally, if you could modify just uh, part of the node, then you could cut the end and it will grow a whole new stem. Then you just cut that, stick it in dirt, and it will just grow roots and you'll have, you'll be done. Super simple. That's something I'm working on. Uh, I've been working on it for two months now without success. So wish me luck. Uh, if I find a good way to do that, I will definitely be uh, sharing that. And uh, that will be a much faster method than tissue culture. Uh, what do I think is stopping it from successfully modifying the nodes or stems? That I don't know. Uh, I've got some, I've got a lot of deep digging to do. There's, it probably has something to do with uh, the cells themselves. Like it's probably a mechanical problem because you can take uh, amorphous cells, um, but it could be also related to, uh, it may be a chemistry thing. Uh, like I could probably, I can possibly change the chemistry to make it more adaptable. I can probably do things mechanically to the, tissue of the stem to make it more likely. Um, do you, can you do tissue culture and modify and grow out those? Yes, you can. Uh, I usually do that to bush out tall growing tree species. Totally. You know, that's, that's a totally normal thing to do. Yeah. It's, um, uh, a lot of plants respond that way because they lose their growth tip. Now they need new growth tips because they can't grow anymore. Um, so yeah, you can, you can do a lot to affect the morphology of a plant by like trimming and cutting and pruning. Um, can you, have you looked to see if the agro is actually injecting into those cells? Uh, so we know that they're injecting into the cells because, uh, they're getting the new DNA and expressing it, right? So the agrobacterium are, you know, white. So anything red is, has got to be our, uh, uh, the result of the enzymes that the genes are coding for. Um, can you modify tissue culture? So one of the things you can do is you can actually take like, a red piece of leaf that you've made and tissue culture it. No, I mean in the tip. Oh yeah, I have no idea. Um, I could probably do some microscopy to see that. That's not a bad plan. I probably will do that just to see if um, uh, if it seems to be a mechanical issue or an expression issue or what. Um, but one thing I am trying is I'm I'm some of those tips that I made. I'm letting them grow all the way out to make. Um, uh, more stuff just to see. Uh, I would inject a hormone that makes the cells and the stem of the plant to be more prone to modification. Yeah. I mean, it's possible. Um, 
I would be interested. There's a lot of things. And honestly, it, it might be just a thing where I have to just try a bunch of different species. So it might be one of those things where um, I can find a different species of plant that it, it works really easily on. Because what I'd really love to do is make it as simple as possible. And I'd honestly like to get away from tobacco. Tobacco just has you know, negative connotations. Um, it's actually a decent plant. Like, um, you know, they're relatively easy to care for and they're really pretty. I really like the way they look like when you give them a lot of light, you know, they get really leafy, um, and not so stemmy. Uh, when you don't give them much light, they get really tall and long. Um, but I really think they're handsome. I mean, look at that. It's like a, it's a very planty plant. Like if you were just like draw a plant, that's not any particular plant. This, this is pretty much what you would draw, right? Um, so it's just like the platonic solid of plants or the platonic ideal of, of plants, right? But okay. Can we do this with herbs that would change the flavor? Oh, 100%. 100%. That's one of the things I really want to do. You could change the flavors. You could change the smells. You could change all sorts of stuff, right? Uh, so one of the things me and Phoenix wants to want to work on is, is making spicy tomatoes, right? What hormone would you have used or would recommend it? Mm. Uh, I don't know what hormone would work. I know there are some things that people add with um, detergents sometimes or different salts um, or, uh, you know, there's a lot of additives that can increase the efficiency of it. And you can also do things like heat shock. So you can take the whole plant, put it in a hot place, and then uh, sort of heat stress the plant, and that can make it more likely to successfully genetically modify. So I'll be trying a lot of these different things. It's just there's a ton of things to try and a ton of species to try them on. Uh, we could definitely do this at Biohacked Planet, definitely. But can you eat them after modifying? So I obviously wouldn't eat tobacco <laughs> unless you really want to throw up. Um, but if you're making uh, if you're making like a like a spice like a spicy tomato or something, right? Um, I have gotten agrobacterium sprayed in my mouth before, and it didn't hurt me. I don't know if it's a good idea, but um, I would probably just take the um, yeah, just ways to weaken the immune system of the plant or damage their things, or maybe even digestive enzymes. There's all sorts of possibilities. Um, uh, you've debugged agrobacterium via microscopy or maybe PCR or something. Uh, yes, I'll talk about that in a minute. But, um, yeah, as far as eating them, I probably wouldn't eat the initial plant. Um, the clone, I would feel okay eating, um, or something grown from the seeds of the clone, right? Because it's, it's just going to be like a plant. Like all plants have bacteria in them, right? Uh, or on them. Like you can't go get some lettuce and it's 100% bacteria free. Um, but because they can modify human cells, probably not ideal. Um, but, you know, successive generations should be fine. Now, uh, how do you get to those generations? So uh, the way it normally works kind of in the wild uh, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but you basically have a, a system where you have your agrobacterium and you have a plasmid on it. And that plasmid is the TI plasmid, the tumor-inducing plasmid. That plasmid basically has three segments functionally. Um, uh, the first one is just the maintenance section, right? Uh, and so that section is, um, uh, it has an origin of replication, which just tells the cell, make copies of me. Uh, cause it's just a little loop of DNA. Uh, and then it often will have a, a, uh, an antibiotic resistance gene. Um, at least a lot of plasmids do, and especially any, uh, uh man-made plasmid will for selection. The second section is the virulence section, right? So that has the virulence genes on it. Uh, and those genes make a suite of proteins that, that actually do the genetic modification. Those are the machinery, uh, of the modification system itself. So they like detect wounded plants, they uh, um, uh, make copies of the DNA payload, and they um, transport it, and they make like a little protein tube that connects the inside of the bacterial cell to the inside of the plant cell, and transport the DNA, and then incorporate it into the plant's genome. 
So that little suite of proteins, what do you know about RNA interference? Do you have any projects in kits fits? Um, uh, I've done some RNAi, but uh, we don't have any kits for this at the moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's the virulence section. And then the last section is your payload. And your payload is just flanked by these two uh, sort of bookended sequences uh, that some of those virulence proteins recognize. And it's like, okay, everything between me and me, or me and you, is what we're going to carry across. So you don't have to leave those in one plasmid. And so what we're working with is actually a two plasmid system. So in nature, it's one plasmid. Uh, and in the lab, it's two plasmids. So the nice thing about it being two plasmids is you can get agrobacterium with the maintenance and virulence genes on one plasmid, and you can have payload on a whole different plasmid. And that means you can easily change the payload, right? So you can just take some that only have the one, and you can just add payload A. And then in a different group of them, you can add payload B. In a different group, you can add payload C. And so you end up with... Um, uh, electroporation does generally require an, an expensive machine, but not always. There are sort of like hacky homebrew ways of doing electroporation. Um, but yeah, so when you have your payload, you know, you can make it whatever you want it to be. So uh, natural agrobacterium carry genes that make uh, tumors in plants and that make the plants make bacteria food. So basically they, they grow up huge number of cells that make bacteria food that only agrobacterium can really eat well. And the agrobacterium just sort of move into their new mansion that excretes food from the walls. Uh, but those genes are removed and we replace them with the Ruby genes. Or not we, the scientists who made this thing, replace them with the Ruby genes. But you can replace the Ruby genes with whatever genes you want in the other plasmid, drop them into the agrobacterium, and then make your spicy tomato. Now, how you actually do that, usually there's uh, restriction sites on either side, uh, you get the new section made. You can either have it made with the, the easiest way is just have it made with the uh, repeats on either side and put that in agrobacterium and you're done. Um, if you want to do it the hard way, you could PCR something out of something else, like uh, go to, you know, a jalapeno, PCR out the enzymes that you want, put them into a construct that you design, you do all this with subcloning. Um, uh, subclone that into your plasmid, pop it in agrobacterium, and you're done. But uh, that's only going to get you to the point. Electroporation is where you um, use electricity to make pores in the holes uh, or in, in the walls of cells. So cell membranes are phospholipid bilayers. So you have these... Um, molecules that all sort of orient themselves in a specific way because of the sort of electrical interactions of their uh, uh, different sides. They have like a head and a tail. And when you put them in an electric field, uh, there's gr an electrical gradient, and that causes those molecules to rearrange themselves. And some of the things that they do is they arrange themselves instead of into a just like a repeating pattern that makes like a, a layer. Uh, they'll they'll arrange themselves into these pores. It's kind of like when they put like a gr bunch of rice on a plate and play a tone into it, and it sort of arranges itself into you know these things depending on sort of the the vibrations. There's a uh, uh, there's a similar thing that happens, and it'll create a hole in the cell membrane that's temporary. And during that time, if you like have a bunch of DNA on the outside, it makes a hole, and DNA can just go in. Then you just turn off the the voltage and. It, closes up and it's gone. So it's usually just a quick zap and DNA is inside. So electroporation is a pretty common method for genetic modification. But obviously you can also just cook stuff with too much electricity. Um, but okay, so you have your, uh, you have your DNA. Uh, it's loaded into your agrobacterium. You've checked it out uh, with your past lipid cell wall. Yeah, totally. Um, and so you've injected it into your plant. You've tested that your plant is, is successfully expressing your genes and it, and it has like the phenotype that you want. Now you want to make a whole plant. So if you can get it to make a shoot from the thing that you have, then you can just dip it in rooting hormones, stick it in some dirt, water it, keep it, you know, keep the humidity up <coughs> and grow a whole plant. You're done. Uh, and well, I would breed that plant, but then you're done. Um, 
the hard way and the sort of current way. And we're actually working on a kit for this that should be out, if I don't find an easier way, uh, should be out sometime next year-ish. Um, but what you do is uh, you make special auger. Uh, you would take either a modified section of plant or uh, an unmodified section of plant, dip it in agrobacterium, kind of swirl it around, let them do their thing, then stick in, you know, wash it off. Excuse me. Stick it in the, um, uh, stick it on the auger. And then you're going to wait for a really long time. And that's the worst part about this is you have to wait a really long time because if you think about when the seeds, then the seeds from that plant will express the changes. Yes. So the ruby red construct uh, doesn't just have the, the genes that make the ruby red. It also has another gene, which is hygromycin resistance. And you actually transport that to the plant. So these red cells uh, are not only making this, this, uh, this sort of beet juice uh, compound that's red, they're also making a gene that makes them resistant to the chemical, the, the, the antibiotic hygromycin. So what you can do is you can take those cells, remove, or remove them, wash them off really good. Uh, usually you have to like bleach them and really clean the heck out of them because if you get like mold spores or something in there, it's going to take over your plate. That's terrible. And that's the hardest part is keeping everything clean um, and trying not to get contamination because you're going to be growing this for a very long time, months. You think about how slowly plants grow normally, then imagine you've only got like a little circle of cells. It's going to take a long time for that little circle of cells to gather enough energy and resources to do anything, especially with no roots, no stem, just a little patch of leaf. Um, but yeah, so you put them on the auger plate. And it's got hormones in it that will uh, revert these cells back to a more primitive state, more stemmy state. They'll, they'll become like embryonic cells. Uh, so this is very similar to uh, like when we work with our human stem cells and converted them into bone and nerve and, and other cells, right? Um, so the, uh, the cells that you put on the plate are hygromycin resistant, but not all of them are modified, or at least not all of them are continuously expressing those modifications. So what you'll do is you'll have hygromycin in the auger. Now that means uh, it's going to kill most of the cells, except for the ones that have the modification. So now you have a selective bias. So the cells that are after a while still living on the plate and growing and being happy are the modified ones. So you should have a little blob of red cells after a while. Weeks and weeks later, uh, it'll become a callus and you'll have this little, literally just a little blob, like tumory looking thing of little green cells that are just, well, I guess in this case, they'd be little red cells. Uh, but if you're making like spicy tomatoes or something, they'll be green. And they're sitting there. And once they reach a certain size, you will pluck them out, put them in a different auger plate, and that will have hormones to make them uh, start to create stems and leaves. And once they like start to de or to start to differentiate, so they're le leaving that stemmy state and starting to become like more mature planty cells and they start to like grow in a regular fashion and you'll get weird looking stuff. But then you take that guy and pop it on something, it'll start to develop roots. Uh, and then the little stems will continue to grow and the roots will start to burrow down. And eventually you'll have a little plant in your little cup, little auger plate, right? Uh, and it'll have roots and it'll have a stem and it'll have your genetic modification on it. Then you'll, you know, acclimatize it to the world, put it in dirt and, and you'll have it in a little pot, a little genetically modified whole plant. Now that takes a long time and you probably want to do a bunch of them because a lot of them are going to get contaminated. Um, so that's really the hard part is because you're growing it for months, you can't, and you've got to like transplant it several times and you can't ever let any mold spores or fungus spores or bacteria or anything in it. So especially doing this in like a biohacker setting, you've got to be really good with your aseptic technique. Um, uh, but yeah, so that little plant will now grow up into an adult plant and you just breed it, you know, and usually you'll self it, right? So you'll breed it to itself if it's a plant that can do that. Um, because when, uh, agrobacterium transports that DNA into the plant, uh, the integration sites are not, um, it's not all the same, right? So you'll have, sometimes you can have multiple integrations in one cell or you can have them integrated into different sites. And so even the little plant you grow from that initial blob of cells, will really it may be like its phenotype may be consistent like it might be a whole red plant or whatever but genetically it will be mosaic so it will have 
a bunch of different, very similar genetic modifications that basically do the same thing, but they're not all made in the same way. And it doesn't really matter, like that plant will still have spicy tomatoes on it. But say you were trying to go to market with it, you were going to like sell spicy tomatoes at the grocery store. Well, you're going to get through the FDA and the FDA is not going to be happy with a mosaic plant, right? So you're going to want to have like a very clearly characterized genetic modification. So what you'll do is you'll grow up your plant, breed it to itself, uh, and then each seed will represent a unique, it'll, you know, because it's starting from one cell when it makes the little plant embryo, uh, it will start and it will be a unique specific genetic modification. So you'll make a bunch of seeds, plant them all, grow them all up, and then you can just sort of compare which ones you like the best. It's like, okay, this one doesn't, it's not quite as spicy as I was hoping. And they'll be different. They'll be like distinct from each other because there'll be uh, manifestations of different transformation events. And they'll be a little bit different. Some will have multiple copies, especially in um, plants that have multiple copies of their whole genome, like polyploid plants, which is pretty common in plants. You can have lots of different sort of expression levels. And sometimes it can get turned off and things like that. So you'll pick the ones you like that are nice and stable and have all the features and traits and everything that you, you, you wanted. And you make sure that the integration event didn't break anything that you wanted. So one has like weird small tomatoes or something. Um, and you end up with the final product. You have the thing that you tried to create and you pick it and breed it to itself and you make, you know, millions of copies. And uh, then it's just plant seeds and grow tomatoes, right? And they're just spicy. So it's really not that complicated in terms of like design. Uh, is your post behind? Transfection with electroporation is very cool. Is your post behind a paywall? I don't think so. All my stuff should be available. I don't think any of my things are behind a paywall. Um, uh, electroporation, uh, I do. I do think I have one video on it. It may or may not be on my YouTube. I had to take a lot of things off of my YouTube because YouTube didn't like some of the things that I had up there. They thought it was dangerous and scary, so I had to get rid of it. But if you check my Odyssey, it should still have all of my things. Um, but yeah, so any, any other questions related to how to make genetically modified plants or what else is possible with genetically modified plants? Hi, Joy. Uh, let's see. One thing you can do uh, in terms of trying to uh, modify plants is obviously you can modify things that change uh, their flavors and tastes and behaviors, right? So like that stuff's pretty straightforward. Um, it's not done a lot, or at least it hasn't been done a lot. Most of the genetic modifications for plants have been really like agriculture focused. So it's like, you know, things that cost farmers, you know, billions. Um, if you have links to another platform, could you please link us on the Odin school page? Not sure what Odyssey is. Uh, Odyssey is just like a, honestly, it's kind of a strange like crypto YouTube, but they don't delete biohacker content because they're scared of what it might teach people. Right. Um, but it's like Odyssey, but like C. Um, like, like I can see, um, I don't want to know how to do a wall, but they, oh no, I do want to know how to do a wall that can stay alive. There's a mural made from plants. Oh, I totally do too. So, um, that's actually something I'm working on at home. Uh, I am building a fence, uh, around my house and, um, my fence, instead of being like, you know, planks and boards and a bunch of dead plants, is going to be a bunch of live plants. So what I want to do is uh, I'm building a, uh, just like a, a, a fence, right? But I'm using field wire um, and then I'm starting ivy all along it, but I'm going to be planting jasmine and honeysuckle around the whole thing. So I just want to make a six foot green wall of beautiful flowering vines. And especially in the springtime when the jasmine and the honeysuckle bloom, it's like, it doesn't matter which direction the wind blows. It's going to smell amazing. So, yeah. And I would definitely love to have like a weird garden of mutants somewhere in the middle. Um, 
Okay, how long would plasmid stay in the cells if you are reproducing them? So the plasmid doesn't really get into the cells. So what happens is uh, the plasmid with the gene of interest, with the payload on it, has these two flanking regions. And these two virulence proteins come up, and one binds to one end and one binds to the other end. And then you've got a double-stranded piece of DNA between them. But what it does is it cuts one strand and then literally peels that strand off. And these other proteins sort of like bind along it to, to support it. And then it cleaves that off and then transports a single-stranded piece of DNA. And then the polymerase uh, of the bacteria repairs that plasmid, makes it double-stranded again, then more bind, and it peels off that bottom one. So it just keeps making single-stranded copies. And that's what actually gets sent to the plant. And then in the plant, it actually gets integrated into the plant's genome. So there's no plasmid in the plant itself. Um, so this isn't just plasmid transfer. It's actually a genomic edit. Uh, and the original plasmid with the payload stays in the bacteria uh, where it can just keep producing copies of the, um, uh, of the genes that it's trying to get across. Uh, have you tried playing with algae of any sort? I haven't tried with uh, genetic modification. Uh, we do have some here that we're growing, and I've grown some that I used to have in the oil field that seemed to eat oil. I don't know if it was the algae themselves or some organism that um, was growing along with them, but I just noticed that there was this algae in the oil field that uh, we had oil-stained rocks in certain places, and everywhere that algae grew, once it dried up and the algae sort of like flaked off, it was a, it was a bottom-growing filamentous algae, produced a ton of oxygen. Uh, and it grew really well. Like anywhere water and sun hit rocks, this stuff would just cover everything. Um, but yeah, all the oil and stains and rust and chemicals and stuff would be gone. So I grew a bunch of that, just sort of playing with it at home, mostly just seeing how, why it cleans up rocks. Um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, as far as algae, I would probably, like I could, I'll do some experiments with, um, agrobacteria because they can, they can modify a, a huge number of, of organisms. Animal cells, plant cells, fungal cells, they've been tried in all sorts of things. Um, they can even modify other bacteria. So uh, agrobacterium are pretty flexible. I'd be surprised if they couldn't modify algae, um, but I'm sure, again, it varies significantly from species to species. Um, and you could just counter select to kill the agrobacterium. So it shouldn't be too hard. Um, it would be interesting to see if you could make like, um, you know, super algae that do the thing that you're looking for. Um, uh, could mix mycology with this type of mod. Yes, you totally can. So man, this Red Bull has me burping a lot. Sorry guys. Um, so yeah, the, um, uh, that's one of the things me and Lear were working on, uh, and a faster turnaround for modification. Maybe so. Uh, you can also do stuff with algae, I think, with electroporation and stuff like that. Uh, there's also some things that have been tried with, like, basically using shearing forces and a lot of pressure uh, to uh, sort of rip the spongy inside, you know, sort of cell membrane-y part out of the hard cell wall part uh, to make them easier to modify. That's always the tricky part about plants, right? Is they 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 have um, uh, they have hard cell walls and not just uh, cell membranes. So plant cells are actually a lot squishier and more flexible and softer than plant cells, and so uh, they're just easier to modify because they don't have all this like armor. Uh, and same thing with with um, fungus. Well, at least like a lot of fungus. Obviously, not yeast, but um, a lot of fungus like um, mushrooms and stuff. They have uh, chitinous exteriors that sort of protect them from external things. So they're also kind of armored cells. But <clears throat> yeah, uh, agrobacterium have been shown to be able to modify uh, mushrooms. Uh, so that's something that Lear and I have worked on. Uh, no success yet, but obviously we haven't done a lot of experiments with it. But yeah, 35S should work. Like uh, the, the promoter that's in the ruby plasmid should work in some species of fungus. Um, and once you have to break the chitin shell before modifying, not necessarily, it depends on how you do it. Uh, a lot of times, yes, you can use enzymes to break that down and make sort of protoplasts. 
Um, but there are methods that can do it even without doing that. So agrobacterium have shown that they're capable of doing it. They're little sort of protein spears are capable of getting through. What are you saying? You were saying most plants being polyploidal are just saying it's additional copy, though, and not different set. We target different copies for the same one. Uh, so lots of plants are polyploids. Uh, not necessarily most. I'm not sure if that's, I don't know if it's most, um, but lots of plants are polyploids. Polyploidy just means like ploidy is the the, nu your, the number of, of sets of chromosomes. So like humans are, are, are uh, uh, diploids. So we have like a full set of genes from your mom and a full set of genes from your dad. And so you have like uh, two copies of like chromosome two and two copies of chromosome three and two copies of chromosome four. Uh, but if you're a polyploid, you might have like six copies of chromosome two and six copies of chromosome three and seven and six copies of chromosome four. Uh, so you definitely could make spicy mushrooms. That's interesting. I never, I didn't think about that until you said that. It's a good idea. I'm gonna have to try mm, spicy mushrooms. You could just kind of get the umami spicy all in one go. I like this. Um, yeah, but yeah, so uh, sometimes though, so like often in polyploid plants, they are multiple sets of identical chromosomes, uh, but often there are differences between the different sets, right? So they can have um, genetic diversity between the chromosomes, just like you can have genetic diversity between the genes you inherited from one parent and the other. Like you can have like, uh, you know, the blue eye gene from your dad, and the brown eye gene from your mom, Well, you can have if you have five copies, you could have five different genes on those. Um, uh, and when you make modifications, it's not necessarily going to just get them all. Uh, Barium vanilla scent mixed in. Yeah, and that's the thing. You could make, so like vanillin, right, which is used in the media. You can smell it. This is honestly the best smelling thing that we have. Um, so you can smell it uh, in the media itself. Uh, so as soon as you open that little guy yeah, you can smell it it smells really delicious um i really like working with the plant media because vanillin is a sort of a stress chemical for plants it's like uh i'm leaking my juices um and uh for us it just tastes delicious uh but that's because we like eating plants um and so are a lot of things cinnamon all this sort of stuff it's all in the same kind of like a general family of, of chemicals and uh you can um, you know, and, and using that is sort of like, it activates the agrobacterium, it activates their virulence genes. They have a surface protein, one of the virulence genes that recognizes these kinds of stress chemicals from plants. And that sort of activates a cascade of gene expression, which makes the rest of the, the virulence genes turn on. Um, wild strawberries versus strawberries from the store. The store strawberries are polyploids. Yeah. And the store strawberries are also, um, uh, hybrids, you know, so they're hybrids of different varieties. One from, uh, I think it was originally made by mixing like Spanish and like South American varieties of strawberries or something like that. Um, but yeah, so they're also like heavily cultivated. Um, but yeah, polyploids do tend to be larger and more productive. Um, but yeah, you can, so the thing is, like all the simple, straightforward stuff that you might think of, just like this plant trait into that plant. Like I want, you know, spicy tomatoes or something. Those are kind of the low hanging fruit, if you'll pardon my pun. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of that, a ton of that. You can create, um, uh, you can create every kind of like flavor modification that you can imagine is probably possible. It's just some are gonna be more complicated than others, right? Uh, and there's some things you have to watch for when you're dealing with certain plants, like, uh, because some like plants are often poisonous, right? So you have to be mindful that when you turn on genes or when you turn on biosynthesis pathways, uh, they won't necessarily only synthesize what you want them to do. They, they can also interact with other things in the cell and make other things, right? So for example, uh, you can add uh, genes to a tomato. So tomatoes are poisonous in all the green parts, right? Just like most of Belladonna, excuse me, like the, the nightshade family, right? It's nightshade. It's like deadly nightshade is one of the members. Um, and so 
the nightshade plants have poisonous compounds uh, in their green parts. That's why you don't eat green potatoes or the leaves of tomato plants or something like that. So the fruits and the roots are fine, but the green parts are dangerous. Uh, so don't eat them. Uh, although it's interesting, people have plenty of spend plenty of time smoking the green parts of uh, tobacco, even though it's nightshade. Um, uh, though it's not good for you, <laughs> in case anybody doesn't know that at this point. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so they're poisonous. But when you're um, when you're adding genes uh, that that do change the chemicals that are available in the cell, and you have genes in the genome that are capable of making poisonous compounds, you just have to be mindful that you don't start making those compounds somewhere else in the cell. So just be mindful of the biosynthesis pathways of these uh, things that you don't want and just do lots of testing, right? Uh, flavor is a really hard target. I mean, if you wanted to do some simple flavors like capsaicin, or if you wanted to do something like spearmint or something like that, the, those things are pretty well characterized. Uh, the problem is uh, flavors are not single things, right? Like you could add vanilla and it would have a vanilla something. Like you added, like if you made an apple that made vanilla in the fruit, it would be like a vanilla apple, uh, which I'm sure would be fucking lovely. Or, excuse me. What I'm sure would be lovely. Um, but the, uh, uh, it wouldn't necessarily taste like vanilla because it would still have all those apple flavors, right? And smells are the same way. So there's all these uh, well-characterized esters uh, and the flavor, all the research that's gone into like flavors and colognes and all of these things have done a good job of, of, of locating exactly what molecules are responsible for certain scents, right? So like musky scents and like apple flavor and lemony flavors and all these different things are pretty well characterized. So you can actually find, okay, this is my target molecule. I want to add it to this species, bam, bam, bam. And you can also do things with like you know, obviously one of the things people talk about a lot is adding THC to other things. Obviously, if one species can make it, other species can make it too. Um, and there's a whole lot of like different possibilities in that space for a lot more than just like uh, psychoactive substances, but also like uh, painkillers and pharmaceuticals and everything you can imagine. Like that's a chemical that a plant could make, you could make in a plant, even things like antibodies and uh, I think there was some research during COVID where they were making, they were trying to make antibodies against COVID in plants so they could just like grow up a bunch of leaves, do a bulk extraction and make a monoclonal antibody stuff that, that doesn't like require you to like kill a bunch of rats. Um, okay. Would it be possible to force uh, the plant to be polyploidal? Yes. Uh, so there are... Um, <sighs> mutagens or uh, teratogens maybe um, that basically there's chemicals that will mess up the process of cell division in such a way that they are more likely to um, produce polyploids and rather than like, you know, duplicate the genome and then uh, pull the whole thing across or, you know, like pull the whole thing into two pieces and then divide the cell. It, it just like, is all messed up so the little pullers are broken and so it makes two copies and then divides the cell and you get a bunch of like different amounts of chromosomes and it can make for a lot of scrambling and then you eventually just sort out to the ones you want and if you want to get like in between those numbers you can always just take that one with lots and lots of chromosomes and breed it to one with less and get less and there's all sorts of ways um we're gonna get the sequence uh I, I can like email the Odin and I'll send it to you. Uh, but it's also on Ad Gene. So if you just look on Ad Gene and you look up like Ruby, uh, it should be there. Uh, uh, it'll be University of California, I think. Um, yeah, and it'll have the whole sequence on Ad Gene. Uh, is there is plant grafting a form of biohacking? Uh, I mean, I probably would not have called it that because it doesn't generally involve modifying the genes of the plant but i mean you're modifying biology so maybe so um i think biohacking is a pretty broad term so it can kind of encompass whatever you feel like 
uh, doing. But if you're making something beautiful and interesting that you enjoy uh, and you're using grafting as a technique to do it, then why not? You can also graft things um, uh, from different species uh, onto you know, each other and make some really interesting things. Like one thing uh, I'm, pl I'm planning on making next spring is uh, you can graft, because they're both nightshade, uh, you can take a tomato top plant and a potato bottom, graft them together, and you'll have a, a it'll make potatoes in the roots and tomatoes on the top. So I'm going to have a bunch of those in my garden uh, next spring. Science for looking into how to target and how to modify plants to create specific terpenes. Yeah, I mean, all sorts of stuff. Uh, I believe it's on a website called AdGene. Yes, it is on AdGene. Uh, probably by putting in plants I've done it a few times. Excellent. Uh, tomato on potatoes. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, I forget what they call them. Tomatoes, something like that. Working on affordable insulin. Yeah. And I mean, anything that a plant could make, you can make with it, which is a lot of things. Like plants are really good at chemistry. Uh, honestly, because they can't move, like they can't fight back. Um, they can't, uh, you know, like something tries to eat them. They can't, you know, jam them with their horns and run away. So they, their chemistry is their whole thing. It's their whole bag, right? So plants have to use um have to use chemicals to do like defense repair all of it right um and so plants are really good at making stuff uh and they're also autotrophs so they don't like they don't well most plants don't just eat things to get things if they want it they have to make it for themselves because they eat light which doesn't have chemicals in it so they like breathe in the, the, you know, carbon dioxide and drink water and get in like a, a few like nitrogen, phosphorus kind of mineral stuff that you need and pretty much everything else they have to make for themselves. So plants are super good at making stuff. Um, well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you love it. I love it too. Uh, still working with yeast, but right now it's difficult. Yeast is interesting. Uh, we have a kit for modifying yeast. Um, Thoughts on bacteriophage modifications. Um, thoughts on, well, let's clarify. Thoughts on using bacteriophages to modify bacteria or thoughts on modifying bacteriophages as the end target? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think it was a COVID vaccine. I think it was a monoclonal antibody, but it might have been. Uh, like, you know, you can make, like, plants can make spike protein. Uh, plants can make anti-spike protein antibodies. Spike could make, I mean, plants can make all sorts of things, right? Um, they're really good factories for making stuff. Uh, both. Okay, so um, mod there's some really interesting phage mids that you can get, which is like a phage genome plasmid hybrid. Uh, and you can just modify those and pop them in E. coli and they'll make your mutant phages, right? Um, uh, and you can induce them sometimes. So you can have them like as plasmid or you can switch them on and use them as phage, which you can then take those phages and dump them on bacteria and they'll, you you can use them as a vector to modify your thing, which is often used in um, directed evolution experiments. So when you want to create a custom protein, you can have it express on the outside of the phage and then uh, use that, use some kind of selection mechanism. Like say you want something that, I don't know, binds, plastic well or something so you have this protein and you just put it on plastic wash all the ones away and you end up with lots of them that bind plastic and then you infect bacteria with those and you keep mutagenizing them and you just do round and round and round and eventually you end up with some protein in the phage mid genome uh that has tons and tons of like adhesive power to plastic and then you have your new protein uh so directed evolution experiments a lot of times use use phages as um uh, a rapid way of selection and, and, and uh, expression. Are there any other plans for plant kits in the making? Yes. So I'm working on making a plant kit that does, well, two things. So uh, we have two plant kits currently, technically. So one is just, um, uh, one is just um, uh, the current plant, the plant kit that, that everybody's getting. The other one is um, uh, uh, like a school version. So it'll have like a couple plants, more gloves, more plates, more stuff. And it's just like a, a bigger version of it made for like whole classrooms. 
Um, the next one we're going to do is we're going to work on adding more genes of interest, right? So uh, you get like a, a little library of, of, of genes, right? So you'd be like, okay, I'm going to take this one makes yellow, this one makes red, this one makes blue, this one makes purple. Blue might be hard. This one makes purple. Um, <coughs> and, you know, you can just sort of make your own custom design with lots of different colors um, because for the most part, that's really what we want. Might do something with smells or something later. Um, but the main thing is going to be uh, uh, colors because it's it's permanent, it's easy, you know, it's visually interesting, and it, it's really easy to tell if you succeeded or not. It's a very clean uh, uh, signal. Um, uh, Open Insulin, I think they have a website and has a, uh, um, I don't know when the last time they did any work with it, but um, they used to allow you to kind of like, video into their meetings uh so i think i have a website and you can you can look up an email should be able to email them um yeah school version is super interesting and will be used well. i hope so too i really hope so too i think the school version like if i was which i didn't go to high school if i went to high school and a high school biology teacher busted out a plant like it's like okay guys we're going to genetically modify this plant and then we're going to like care for it for the rest of the year and watch it like grow in the window our like custom mutant plant you can do whatever you want with it i don't know i would have flipped out it would have been crazy like who does that who has that and then it's just there it's just a living thing that y'all made a mutant out of sitting in the classroom you know you take turns watering it beautiful um uh let's see okay so there are definitely ways to change plant growth rates through modifications i mean that's uh that's really what agrobacterium normally do right so they normally change the growth rate of the cells that it produces tumors right so uh but there are other modifications that can increase the efficiency of photosynthesis or uh decrease it if you want to slow them down um all kinds of crazy stuff right um but yeah so the other thing so we want to expand like the palette um of of genes that are available um Teachers and faculty are freaked out by this. Yeah, and that's okay. You know, I mean, it's new. It's 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 very different, um, and it'll take time. And I know that like uh, there's a lot of people out there who probably don't want to be the first school teacher to make make GMOs in class. And tobacco is probably not the most appealing species. But you know, <laughs> tons and tons and tons of schools use our CRISPR kits. Um, there are schools that buy you know, every year, you know, semester starting up, which a lot of these are colleges, but semester starting up, they just buy a whole bunch of our 101 kits. They buy a whole bunch of lab kits. They buy a whole bunch of CRISPR kits. And that's just part of their curriculum. Every year they do the CRISPR kit with each each new class. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, you can definitely change carbon types, right? So you can, you can use like algae-based uh, photosynthesis uh, to, and there's there's actually some really interesting research papers on that um, where they modified plants to use uh, sort of the other photosynthesis um, to make faster growing, more aggressive, like super plants. Um, and you could definitely, I definitely want to try that in like tomatoes because who doesn't want a super productive tomato plant in their garden, right? Um, but yeah. The... Um, was I saying before? Uh, yeah, so, uh, oh, and then, so the next thing will be um, expanding it into mushrooms, hopefully, algae's a good idea. Um, I would love to be able to have a genetically modified mushrooms kit, so you can just like, <coughs> even if it's agrobacterium based, take your agrobacterium, do whatever you gotta do to the mushroom, and you start getting like mutant mushroom, that would be super cool. Um, and then uh, when you take a, um, well, thank you, David. I, I, you know, I mean, me too, right? Like I started out as a fan, now I work here. Um, the, um, I think that's one of my favorite things though, is when like schools or like young people will will email back and be like i can't believe i get to do this you know it's super amazing because i think that's really like 
that's how you make a difference in the future is by helping the people who are going to be like the leaders of the future to to see the possibilities or to, to experience it for themselves. Uh, I think you really can grow things in a really beautiful direction just by like shining a light on it. Um, but yeah, uh, so mushrooms maybe, and then we're going to do a plant callus kit if I can't find a better way. So I'd love to do, find some way to make it like, um, like a, a root and shoot kind of thing. So you can just like do something, uh, you know, comes out, then you just like do a cutting, plant it and, and you get your thing. You don't have to do tissue culture because tissue cultures take forever and they're frustrating. Um, and they have a high failure rate. Um, but yeah, so if you take a, um, uh, uh, but if I, barring that, uh, I'm trying to make a way to make tissue culture easier, uh, like this agro infiltration, super easy protocol. Uh, the whole protocol takes, uh, like you pour the plates, streak out the bacteria. The next day, the whole protocol takes 10 minutes, right? Super easy. But the original protocols that I was working with took days. So this is like a three day process and you need various machines. So I spent months simplifying and finding out what you need and what you don't need. Uh, and it turns out there's just a ton of stuff in the normal protocols that you don't necessarily have to have. Now, I will say this, for, it's easy to get a strong signal from an enzyme based reaction, which is the same reason I, I changed our, um, or the same reason our human cell kit uses an enzyme based reaction, because uh, even if the expression is pretty low, it'll just slowly accumulate more and more of the end product over time. And as long as the end product is stable, you know, eventually you'll see it, right? So like, even if your infiltration isn't particularly well done, it'll eventually turn red. Uh, it may just be really slow, where if you were using something like GFP, uh, you may have to get a really efficient, super, like, really, really good job to try and get a lot of it to express so that it's visible at all. Um, and if you're trying to do some other compound, uh, you know, you may have to, like, really get crazy with it to try and get it to where it's it's a high enough expression level that uh, you can get a, a clear signal out of it. So enzymes help with that because... Uh, the enzyme catalyzes a reaction. It's not the end product. So even if you make a little enzyme, a little enzyme can make a lot of product with time. So um, if I can take um, and do the same thing and simplify uh, tissue culture, which is a big task, um, <clears throat> I would love to create a kit where you can set up at home even if it has to have some kind of still air box or something like in the kit or, or something like that, um, do the genetic modifications. Um, slowly grow your callus and make your permanent own like self-replicating strain so that you can make, because what I would really love, what I want for myself and what I'd love to be able to share with others is the opportunity to create a garden that is your own imagination right so like this is sort of a, a a thing i've had in my mind for a long time is this idea of just like walk into my little greenhouse and in there i have it's like a a sort of a little garden of plants that are my own you know plants that are expressions of my creativity and desire so that when i look at it i see okay, there's my spicy tomato and my this and my that. And I have all of these different um, things that I've imagined and made real growing and alive and happy in my little garden. And you don't necessarily have to just be, uh, you don't necessarily have to just, you know, go to the shelf and pick things that are. You can create things that never were and care for them and, plant them year after year and, and garden them and, and make your own little beautiful space full of anything you can dream of. And I would love to be able to offer that as a like all in one kit that that is easy enough that anybody can do it. And I, I think that would be really, really powerful. And I think it would be a really interesting thing for anybody who's interested in gardening at all to be able to really take it to that next level instead of just like crossbreeding, you can go really crazy with it and do genetic engineering 
uh, in a reliable way. A weed like superfood. Yeah, totally. Right. So like I was thinking about that, like, like kudzu is uh, basically useless, right? But it's super energetic organism. Like I grew up in Mississippi. I mean, kudzu grows a foot a day in the summer. It's wildly productive, but all it produces is kudzu. If you could divert some of that energy into making like apples or something, gourds, anything, anything useful other than just vines and leaves, it would be really, really productive plant. Uh, and it's pretty hardy. I mean, that's why they're trying their best to kill it and it won't go away. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, it would be definitely making like plants hardy. So there's... Um, some really interesting research on <coughs> some really interesting research on um, uh, uh, making drought resistant plants, right? So there's a lot of plants that are um, there's a lot of plants that are naturally drought resistant. You know, they're like uh, desert plants, and they can just shrivel up and turn brown, and they look completely dead. And it rains, and they just rehydrate and pop back to life. And I saw a presentation on some of that research and a lot of it had to do with expression of genes that are present in seeds. And you think about it, seeds dehydrate. Like that's part of how they switch off. Uh, so when seeds dehydrate, they are, yeah, you should definitely be careful modifying wild organisms because they can get wild. But um, yeah, so if you have a, uh, um, uh, shoot. Now I forgot what I was saying. Oh yeah. So, uh, you have a, a seed of any plant, like a tomato plant, right? Corn, corn seeds get dry, completely dry, desiccated, and you plant them and they get wet and grow corn, right? So corn is capable in its embryonic phase of surviving being dry. Uh, doesn't need, you don't need to water corn seeds, right? But, uh, when you plant them, uh, they need water. If they ever dry out too much, they'll just die. And that's just it. It's dead corn. Plow it under and start over. Uh, but what they did was they switched on some of these genes so that they continue to express uh, in the adult plants. And these are seed genes, but also they're, they're expressed in these um, high hardiness, uh, drought resistant uh, desert plants. And uh, they were able to make drought resistant corn. So you can like dry it out. And it's all shriveled and dead. And then you water it and it just bleh grows a nice new pretty um you know the, the the corn can recover from it so it reduces the constant need to water things you can wait for the rain uh and it just reduces loss and waste and 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 so like the amount of tillage and all sorts of stuff right um you can also make things that are salt tolerant or cold tolerant or um you know you can kind of move these sort of extreme plants that have these uh, extreme tolerances uh, to there. And there's a ton of research being done in making plants that are um, uh, nitrogen fixing, uh, which is complicated because it means you have to interact with these other organisms. But um, if you can make plants that are effectively self-fertilizing, which some plants are uh, with the help of bacteria, you can, if you do that with crop plants, you have corn that's self-fertilizing that you don't need to add fertilizer. You're just getting more productive corn. Um, Yes, you can modify plants to produce more oxygen than normal plants do. Uh, plants normally don't like try to produce oxygen. You know, it's it's like they consume oxygen also. They have mitochondria. Um, but the chloroplasts produce more oxygen than they use while they're doing photosynthesis. So it all depends on the 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 amount of photosynthesis getting done. And doing like infinite photosynthesis isn't always the limiting factor, right? So like um a lot of times like plant growth is limited by the availability of things like nitrogen and phosphorus, which is why fertilizer is so big. But uh, yeah, you could definitely crank up the amount of, of uh, photosynthesis that a plant does in some pretty straightforward ways. One, just more leaves, bigger leaves, it instantly creates more oxygen. Uh, but also you can make uh, photosynthesis more uh, efficient or more productive, and you can end up with um, just more oxygen per unit time uh, than the regular version of that plant would create.
or modify invasive species so they aren't. So the trouble with that is you can modify a thing to make it less in invasive. So let's say um, kudzu, right? So you make a, a kudzu that grows less well and uh, is less uh, uh, aggressive than regular kudzu. Well, that's wonderful uh, in terms of um, kudzu. The problem is it doesn't get rid of the other kudzu, right? So you can modify the one that you have in your lab. And even if you plant it outside, it starts growing. But competing with the other kudzu, it just can't keep up, right? So the other kudzu just, just grows over it and kills it because it's more aggressive, just like kudzu does with every other plant. So it's about having some kind of selective advantage. Um, and so trying to get things to like compete with virulent invasive species is just always going to be tricky. Uh, that's kind of where like gene drives can sort of be a thing, but gene drives aren't as big a thing with plants because plants can self-fertilize. So you don't even like need to breed, at least a lot of plants, you don't even necessarily need to breed with other plants. So like when you can just clone yourself, gene drives don't interact with you. Um, let's see, any other questions? Yeah, one thing I would love to see is um, like kind of building on the insulin thing is um, if you like are going to space or something, uh, you can't necessarily bring all the drugs that humanity has available with you, right? Like you can't bring every conceivable drug because that's like a big piece of payload and it's perishable. But what you could do is you could bring uh, genes. So DNA is super easy. And especially if we brought like a gene synthesis machine to like Mars and you could just print off whatever genes you want, then all it's all on a hard drive, right? So we have an easy method, then you can bring like some seeds and, you know, uh, uh, maybe some agrobacterium freeze dried and, a, and a, a, a library of genes, either in like freeze dried little tubes of every gene you could need or just a literal library, or you could honestly just like email it to them, right? pop it in the machine, it spits out your DNA, you put it in the bacteria, you put it in the plant, the plant now makes your drug on site. So instead of like, oh man, the nearest, you know, whatever the quinine or whatever is, you know, on, is on another planet, you can literally just manufacture it here from the seeds, you know, and you could have it where it can manufacture anything. If you design a big library of, of pre-tested plasmids, literally anything uh in in days turnaround time you know so the ability to biosynthesize pharmaceutical compounds i think it's going to be a big part of ever getting like a realistic um uh like mars colony going uh where you don't have to um you know depend on i don't know somehow being able to rapidly get stuff or people just being like oh, i'm sorry you're too far away from medicine you're just going to die unfortunately <laughs> And so, like, imagine you develop diabetes on Mars. Like, where are you going to get your insulin from? You know, just be really careful, I guess. <clears throat> so, um, seems like you could make it a more invasive, more useful kudzu, trying to make it fruiting, more nutritious animals. Yeah, you probably could make a, a more useful kudzu, for sure. Um, it could be done with mushroom mycelium. Uh, there are some... <laughs> There are some, um, there are definitely ways to modify mycelium and, uh, agrobacterium is one of the ways that's been shown to be able to do it. And that's something we're working on sort of kitifying is like a mushroom genetic engineering kit. Uh, that'll probably be this year. Um, but it's months and months away. Uh, but yeah, you can do exactly the same thing with, um, mycelium. So you, instead of packing seeds, you can pack spores and do the same thing. Right. Uh, yeah, so that was actually one of the things. So this is a um, this is an interesting thing. Uh, uh, this idea of using like sundew plants. So one of the things I wanted to do early on, and I, I, I still plan on doing kind of eventually, uh, is make a pitcher plant. So the interesting thing about pitcher plants is that they excrete compounds into discrete jugs. So 
the end of a pitcher plane, right? So you have like, well, so you have like a leaf, right? And then it'll have this long tip that then shoots back up and makes a little cup, right? And normally, uh, you know, flies get attracted to it and they die in there and, uh, you know, it, it uh, digests them and, and eats their juices. Um, yeah, so uh, the juices uh, inside that, some of it's water, but a lot of it's produced by these like uh, uh, honeydew glands, these specific glands inside the leaf. Uh, and they have specific promoters that produce the compounds that attract flies and stuff, right? So if you modify the plant, you can get it to produce other compounds in those things. And you might even be able to locally modify as that sort of tip is growing so that the, the pitcher that it creates creates new things. So you could have like, you could imagine having a pitcher plant and it's got all these different pitchers and the little pitchers have little tags on them. And then each one produces different things like, oh, this pitcher plant produces insulin, which is just a protein. This plant produces, uh, you know, melanin and we slurp it out and stuff stick it in our printer and it prints with like squid ink. Uh, this plant produces, you know, this pitcher produces, you know, whatever. This pitcher produces whatever. So you could have like all these different little pitchers that, that are literally just sitting there excreting compounds into water uh, that you can either purify or use as is depending on what it is, right? Um, <clears throat> and so I think it'd be really, really beautiful to have. And some of these things produce, you can make like a whole wall of this plant and it'll have a hundred little pictures on it and each one could have different things that you've engineered it to create. It would be really, really crazy. Um, <clears throat> but honestly, it would be the same basic process. So once you got the process down for one, you just change the gene of interest that you want to be expressed in the, uh, in the picture. And then it's just a repeatable process. Then you can just change that gene, put a different gene in there and boom, the next picture makes the next thing. Uh, library of base pathways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so much stuff. Like, honestly, I think a lot of this is going to be really important for things like space exploration because, um, you know, you can have, you can have everything that we normally produce in whole fields um, or that we produce with complex bioreactors and things like that, uh, especially things that are highly perishable, monoclonal antibodies, uh, uh, RNA and DNA based products, um, you know, uh, 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 anything that's a protein, usually depending on the protein, some proteins are really stable. Um, uh, is just going to be easier to make on site, right? And instead of having to bring, uh, hi, Julian. So instead of having to bring everything from uh, from Earth to Mars to make all these different products, you can just uh, bring like a base plant that you're really good at modifying and the tools to modify it and a library of tested techniques. And then you can just make whatever you need on site. You know, somebody gets... Mm, you know, poisoning from some heavy metal or, or perchlorate salts or something, but it's okay. You have a, an antibody that you've designed to bind to it and make it not biologically available anymore. But unfortunately, you don't have any. So you print off the DNA, stab it in the plant. A couple of days later, they just like eat their lettuce and it starts doing its work. And uh, I think that's really beautiful. I think it's really powerful because um, otherwise, what's your option? wait. <laughs> I mean, maybe you can make it in some other organism, right? Make it in bacteria, purify it, make it in uh, uh, fungus or something. But yeah, having plants that you can reliably make lots of things. Uh, can you modify the density of any specific compound within a plant? Oh, of course. I mean, technically, you always are, right? So like, you could say, like with the ruby, right? So you could say the, the red compound, uh, betalin, is... Um, has a concentration of zero and you're increasing it to something above zero, right? But let's say you wanted to knock something down. You could do RNAi to reduce the concentration of that by changing gene expression of the enzymes that make it. Or you could make some other enzyme that turns it into some other product and get rid of it that way. Or you could make it, um, you know, up 
upregulate or uh, just introduce new enzymes uh, that make that thing. Uh, yeah, sorry about the long delay. It's probably just the internet being weird. Um, but yeah, so say you want to create a, um, uh, I don't know, you, you really want to upregulate, I don't know, some compound. The one everybody's probably thinking, THC. You want to make more THC. Yeah, you just upregulate the amount of enzymes that make that, put it in a plant that has all the necessary uh, prerequisites, and then bam, it'll make more of it. As long as those enzymes were the rate limiting step. So that's the thing that a lot of people don't necessarily understand about trying to increase the amount of a compound in a system like this is that <clears throat> don't think of it as an object, right? Um, because if you think of it as an object, uh, it's too still. It's a process, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a continuously moving process. Hold on, my throat's getting dry. So everything, all the compound sort of levels within a plant are at some sort of equilibrium. And that's not a still target. So they're at equilibriums, many, many equilibriums for each of these different compounds, right? And it depends on a lot of things. Is there, is it currently photosynthesizing? Like these will shift day and night. They'll shift like how much water does it have? What's the humidity level? All the different like environmental things will change that in the plant. And the plant also has its own like biological rhythms. Uh, it has like a, 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 its own kind of internal clock and circadian rhythms and these things drift around. So uh, if I were to take, um, if I were to take something uh, where I want to change the equilibrium from here to here, if this enzyme is available and it's like manufacturing this stuff and then some other enzyme is unmanufacturing it or turning it into something else or just breaking down over time or being utilized, whatever. So the, two, the, the rate of the two, so like if I increase the production rate, equilibrium goes up. If I increase the destruction rate, equilibrium goes down. Well, if I increase the amount of enzyme, like I double it, that might increase the production rate. But if that enzyme is working at 100% and there's a lot of unoccupied enzyme that just doesn't have the prerequisite, like, you know, you got a brick making machine, it's only running half the time because it, it doesn't have enough clay to keep it running continuously. So adding three or four brick making machines doesn't doesn't make more bricks, right? It's still like the rate limiting step is the amount of clay. So in that scenario, you increasing the amount of enzyme wouldn't change the equilibrium, right? So what you would need to do is you need to back up the biosynthesis pathway, find what is the rate limiting step, whatever component is missing or whatever is holding you back, whether that's energy, uh, uh, some mineral or some other like biosynthesis pathway. Uh, and crank that up. Sometimes you can increase the availability of things by breaking things. This is this happens a lot when you're breeding plants. So like you want a lot more whatever in your thing. A lot of times the first mutations that increase the amount of a thing in something are actually something else breaks and stops using that. And so it just accumulates. You get lots of it. And you can also do this by manipulating the environment of the plant. So you can be like, oh, I'm going to grow it in the dark. And so it can't use this thing. And so a lot of the other thing that you're looking for builds up over time. Uh, so it would slow the opposite enzyme. Is that right? Sorry for the question. Just trying to understand. Not necessarily. Um, it's just, it's a complex moving system. And you have to do it from like a systems analysis kind of perspective, right? So you just can't think of it as like add enzyme that increases the amount. Often it will, but sometimes the target is not clear. So sometimes it's like you could add all, you could have infinite amounts of enzyme and it won't go any faster because what you really need is more phosphorus for an enzyme three steps up the biosynthesis pathway to be able to utilize that to make this, to make this, to make this, to make this, to make this. To make this. Um, and uh, so you've got to figure out like, why isn't it higher already? And then tweak that because sometimes why isn't it higher isn't just I need to add more enzyme. Um, but yeah, you can definitely use it to modify things. It's just important to bear in mind that sometimes the 
the rate limiting step isn't always the last step in the process, right? So you just have to kind of like dig through and find out what the what the holdup is. What's the rate limiting step? If you think about it, just like you had a, a, a construction crew building buildings, um, you got five guys standing around and one guy's like the slow guy at the saw, slowly cutting boards. Well, he's the rate limiting step. But two guys on saws, you can speed up everybody else because they're no longer waiting around for him to produce cut boards, right? So it's just a matter of finding the rate limiting step and expanding that. Um, and sometimes the rate limiting step is physics. You know, sometimes it's energy, sometimes it's time, sometimes it's um, it's temperature, sometimes it's a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, you can you can definitely like increase the amount of stuff like anything you could do with breeding or has been done with breeding. You could definitely do with genetic engineering and a whole lot more. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Another thing that we're going to try and do uh, is protoplast fusion. Uh, so I think that will be a really cool kit. So you can actually do protoplast fusion where you take a plant cell, uh, break down its uh, hard cell wall so that you get like a flexible, juicy cell that's more like an animal cell. And then you can merge them together. Bloop. And that's another way of getting uh, polyploids, right? So you can just like take two cells and just go... Burr. Um, uh, and you end up with, you know, a double cell, basically. It's got two nuclei, but when it tries to divide, it'll dissolve the nuclear membranes and it'll make double the amount of chromosomes, but they don't all have to be from the same species. So you could take like a pepper plant and a potato plant and you could merge them together and you can get a hybrid plant that has all the genes of both. It's totally a thing that people do. Um, and so that's something I would love to do as a kit because how crazy is that? Especially if you could do it with uh, nightshade because nightshade creates a whole lot of plants that, that we have as crop plants that you can work with. So you could put, like make a you know, make a real tomato potato, right? It's like both and who knows how it would grow. Or you could mix things that are crazy like a, a watermelon and a pine tree. I mean, like because when you're doing protoplast fusion, They've done protoplast fusion with weird things. They've done protoplast fusion between different kingdoms. Doesn't always work, but a lot of times it does because you have all the genes from both species. So nothing's like broken, but a lot of times it doesn't know how to become what these genes tell it to be. Uh, if you have a plant with an odor of smell, can you change it to something pleasant? Uh, yes, so you can. So one of the things you can do <coughs> is you could use agrobacterium to deliver something like CRISPR. Uh, and you could use CRISPR to target a specific cell that or a specific gene that you want to cut and destroy or break. And you can use Cas9 to cut and destroy and break that gene. Um, uh, knockouts are the easiest thing to do with Cas9 um, versus adding things. So uh, you could also add things that subtract something, right? So you could add uh, uh, an interfering RNA that reduces the expression of something that makes the stinky compound and reduces the stinky compound. Yeah. Yeah, cell mixing. So like, yeah, I mean, protoplast fusion is a wild technology. They used to do a lot of this back when... Like back before there was really anything you could do because that was the only thing people could do. So they did weird stuff. One of my favorite papers of all time is they took uh, plant cells and they made protoplasts and then they inseminated them with bull and human sperm <laughs> just to see what would happen. This is like, this is what, what biology was up to in the 80s, right? Because like didn't have CRISPR, didn't have PCR, didn't have anything, right? So they were just doing weird stuff. Um and some of them like divided into plantables. I don't know. It's wild. Um, is it possible to infuse modified fungus into a plant cell to act like another organelle? So there are fungi that are, um, uh, what are they called? Um, they're fungi that are uh, uh, parasites inside the cell. But they're also fungi that are uh, symbiotic that live inside they're bacteria and stuff that live inside the fungal cell. And they're, uh, and you can also have fungal cells that get inside plants. I'm not sure if they actually get inside the plant cell. I'd be surprised if they didn't. Um, but they're definitely parasitic fungi that are already completely like 
adapted for living inside plant tissues. Uh, so you could definitely take um, those fungi, modify them, and use them to modify the way the sort of outcome of plants are. Uh, citrus, allele. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. So, like, but the, but my point is, my my point is, protoplast fusion can be used for all sorts of things. You can fuse two different animal cells together. You can fuse two different plant cells together. You can fuse two different fungi cells together. You can do crazy stuff with protoplasts um, because you basically just smush two cells together and then see what happens, right? So, if you take two closely related plants, like a bell pepper and a tomato and you just moosh them together they'll probably work like they'll probably make a plant and that plant will probably fruit into something i don't know what those fruits will look like i could vaguely tell you what the plant will look like because tomato and and, and pepper plants are pretty similar but the fruits are pretty distinct so it'd be really weird and interesting to see what the fruits look like like a half bell pepper half tomato and it's going to be like a random because they're going to try and express all the genes what the outcome of that is who the heck knows um which is part of the reason i want to try it it's just completely wild and crazy and they don't even consider that to be a genetically modified organism at that point it's just a hybrid weird plant it's just a way of hybridizing plants to the extreme, right? So it's instead of like half the plant's genes and the other half the plant's genes, and they have to be closely related, you can just take whatever and smoosh them together and they make a something. And some of them just won't grow into plants, right? They'll just be like a weird blob that kind of like half makes a leaf and never like, you know, it's like the fly it just doesn't quite work out. Um, yeah, I totally get it. The, um, but yeah, I mean, it would be really interesting, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> charge extra. <laughs> We're definitely going to teach stuff uh, about uh, plant stuff at Biohack Planet. Uh, we've got it coming up pretty soon. We're, we're trying to do like a, do a couple of them. So we're going to do like one that's workshops, which we did um, recently. And then six months later, we're going to do one that's like talks, uh, more like a traditional conference because the you can only have so many people. At, at workshops because the workshops are, I mean, they're, they're a lot, they're a lot of work. You have to, um, you know, uh, uh, especially when you have a big crowd, you've got 20 people trying to like engage with everybody and make sure everybody gets a chance to try their st the thing. It's tricky. Um, but if you're giving a, like a talk, a more traditional, uh, uh presentation, uh, that's, that's pretty easy. And that's, that's something that you can do, um, to as many people as you can fill a room with. So we're trying to make it more available because obviously the workshops will always have to be small, um, small enough we can handle. And then the um, the, the more talk traditional uh, biohack the planet will be a bigger event that more people can come to, and and we can get stuff out. So you can claim your hot tomato is non-GMO. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, and also things that are made by radio breeding. So, like, if you just take plant seeds and bombard them with radiation until happy mutations happen, uh, you can also call that um, non-GMO. Although, I will say there are a lot of high-value plants on the market that I'm pretty sure were genetically modified because, honestly, you can't tell. Like, depending on how you do it, you can do genetic modifications in ways that leave no scars. Um, but, yeah, you can do, like, if you're hybridizing things, that's one way you'll see some people will change things and be like, oh yeah, we were breeding this to that. We just bred them together. And then happy accident. We got six copies of this gene in there. And now it just makes wild amounts of this compound we're after. Um, so lucky us, we have a strain that makes this thing. Um, and it just kind of chalk it up to hybridization. But, but you could also just make sure it went that way. But yeah, Atomic Garden, yeah. I think, um, yeah, yeah, you can definitely just take radiation and bombard seeds and they'll mutate and then you just pick the ones you like. That's how a lot of plants uh, that we eat today were made, like ruby red um, or what are they? Uh, like the red grapefruits, 
they're made by bombarding grapefruit seeds with radiation. Um, sunflowers, I'm pretty sure. Um, at least sort of the modern sunflower. Uh, a bunch of the different stuff. They did it back in the day before genetic engineering was really a thing. Like back in like the, I think the 50s is probably around when they started. Maybe even earlier than that. But yeah, just like seeds plus radiation plus selection. It's just selective breeding with mutation encouragement. But it's super easy because it doesn't even have to be like super aggressive radiation. You don't have to use gamma rays and x-rays and stuff, although you can. Um, x-rays are actually pretty easy. You can get an x-ray tube and just bombard it. Or you can get gamma ray sources uh, for biology, a uh, little puck of radioactive material that, that you just like put like really close to it and put it in a box and then it just like um, irradiates it. Yeah, any kind of high energy uh, um, ionizing radiation will work. But you can also take things like <clears throat> uh, UVC, right? So you can take um, uh, you can take like a, a sterilizer bulb, you know, like a like a, a UV bulb that's intended to kill things. It kills things because it has ionizing radiation. You can just like meh, 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 and then just bombard. I wouldn't do seeds because seeds are usually coated in stuff that blocks UV light. But like young plants or whatever. Um, you can just bombard them or pollen, you can do pollen, <clears throat> bombard them with radiation. If you do too much, you'll just kill everything. Um, if you don't do too much, um, you can just like break the DNA. So you want to do like a little bit of genetic damage and then give it time. Uh, and then, uh, you know, let it go back, but you can also take, yeah. So yeah, UV is used for mutagenesis. Um, x-rays are used and you can get like a little vacuum tube that produces x-rays when you put voltage through it. Uh, or like I said, you can just get like a little radioactive pellet that you can, you know, like with some tweezers, <laughs> just leave it, leave your seeds piled on it for a while and then plant them and see what weird stuff grows. Does the type of radiation dictate its modification of the grammar? Um, so generally speaking, the more energetic the radiation, so like the more energetic the photon, the more dramatic the damage. So uh, if you use a, a something like UVC or UV, um, the, 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 if you think of it like a collision, right? So you've got a string of DNA, right? So you've got this high energy photon coming through and it just smacks it. And it's going to like <laughs> spatter DNA. And then the, the cell will have to repair it. Uh, and often it will make mistakes. And so you get mutagenesis. Um, but if you hit it with a much more powerful photon, you get like bigger damage, bigger explosions. So you'll get like bigger chunks of DNA that get damaged and have to be repaired, which is why gamma radiation is more damaging than UV. Um, it's just more energetic photons, more, more energy imparted to the molecule and more scattering. So you get bigger chunks of damage uh, per collision. So it can change like the size of the mutations. Uh, but generally speaking, selection is going to be the biggest factor, right? So you're just like inducing chaos and selecting order. So it's just like chaos, order, chaos, order, chaos, order. And so you just like add chaos, select some novel thing out of the chaos, make seeds from it, add more chaos, select, add more chaos, select. So it's just controlled chaos that allows you to sort of explore into new spaces. But okay, that's two hours. So I think I'm pretty much done here. Any last second questions? Sorry for anybody who has a long delay on their uh, uh, chat function here. <clears throat> but my, my voice is about done for now. Yeah, and that's another thing. So like um, you need a bigger lab. Honestly, radiation breeding, especially with things like tobacco that have teeny tiny little seeds, like you need a lab about this big, you know, so a cup full of seeds and some radiation, you're good to go. You can also do it with chemicals. You don't have to use radiation. You can use, um, uh, there's all sorts of chemicals that, that can create mutations also. So, but just be careful with both, you know, anything that creates mutations, be careful with it, right? Like if it's like random mutagenesis, be careful. If you're dealing with gamma rays, don't like, handle it a lot. It's bad for you. Uh, and if you're dealing with uh, mutagenizing uh, chemicals, also don't handle it with your hands. It's bad for you. Be careful. You know, nobody wants mutations. Mutations can mean cancer. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know if alcohol would work for mutagenesis. Maybe I would be more worried it would kill stuff because of its like dehydrating effects before it mutagenized things. It would probably take a really long time. Um, which chemicals would you recommend? I would look in, I would just Google it, like what's normally used for plants, uh, because it's going to depend on a lot of things. And there are various different safety risks that you'll have to take into account depending on it. I've never used them personally. Um, It's good to see you. Uh, okay, I'm not doing anything too crazy. I'm not doing anything too crazy yet. All right. Well, y'all have a good evening. Um, thank you guys for sort of attending, and I um, look forward to seeing the people that are coming to Biohack the Planet. We'll we'll do lots of cool plant stuff, and probably people coming to Biohack the Planet will get a little preview of the progress we've made um, before um, you know before the kits are complete and stuff like that. So. Uh, Alrighty. Everybody have a good night.